So we're going to be closing out our series today, and uh, I'm going to be preaching about how to honor your spouse. And uh, I've got a lot of points for you, a lot of biblically-based uh, things. So if you're a note-taker, I encourage you to take notes. And if you're not a note-taker, I encourage you to take notes. If you're not taking notes, I assume you're going to watch it back later, and then you can take notes then. Amen? So just to get an idea of who I'm talking to today, if you're single in the house, not married, raise your hand. Raise your hand. If you're single and looking, go ahead and leave your hand up. All right, if that works out, y'all know who to thank later. All right, if you're married, raise your hand. All right, if you're married and looking, keep your hand. No, I'm kidding. Don't, <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. So I want to start this morning with our theme scripture. It's found in 1 Peter, and we're going to check it out together. It's going to be on the screen, and it says this. Peter starts out by talking about, you know, wives, submit to your husbands, because the husband is the head of the home. And so, men, before you start beating your chest and getting all excited about that, let's look at this scripture, because it says, in the same way, you husbands must give honor. So right there, it's saying, like, this is not something that's optional. You must give honor to your wife. Treat her with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are. Now, let me just say here, this is not in any way talking about spiritual weakness, okay? This is not saying that a woman is in any way spiritually inferior to a man. This is simply saying, guys, you're a man, you need to treat her like a lady. And when you deal with her, you need to understand that she's delicate. Because how many of you guys know, like, as men, we need it, like, really spelled out for us. And so Peter's trying to help us out here, and he's like, hey, be gentle in the way that you, you handle things with your wife. But it says that she is your equal partner. So if we had any question there, that clears it up in God's gift of new life. And then this is the really sobering thing right here. It says, if you don't treat her as you should, your prayers will not be heard. So give honor to your wife or your prayers will not be heard. I don't know about you, but to me that was pretty sobering as I read through that this week. And so this morning, I want to give you eight ways to honor your wife, eight ways to honor your wife. And uh, before I do that, I want to just take a quick moment to honor my wife. Um, not only is she amazing and beautiful and funny and smart and, intel and a million different things, but today's also her birthday. So would you stand, babe, real quick, please? I've got some flowers for you. I love you. And I'm better because of you, babe. Thank you for everything that you are in my life. Okay, so number one, number one way that we honor our wife is to honor her intuition. Honor her intuition. How many of you know that women just have a certain intuition about things, right? They just, it's like something just goes off in their brain. A guy's standing there in the fog still not knowing what's going on, and a woman's already figured it out. She's got this intuition. In fact... This, I read this, you, you wouldn't believe how many medical journals and articles are out there about a woman's intuition, but a 2008 study in the British Journal of Psychology defined intuition as what happens when the brain draws on past experiences and external cues to make a decision, and it happens so fast that the reaction is at an unconscious level. So women, you don't even know that you're doing it, you just have this inside intuition and so you say, well, yeah, Oren, but what does that have to do with the Bible? Like, where do we find that in Scripture? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because in Matthew 27, we find where Judas had just betrayed Jesus to the religious leaders of the day. And an angry mob wanted to crucify Jesus. They wanted to kill him because he didn't look like what they expected. But the problem was they did not have the authority to kill him themselves. So the man that they had to go to was a man named Pilate. At the time, Pilate was the Roman governor, and so Jesus goes before Pilate, and Pilate begins to question him and basically puts Jesus on trial, asking him all these questions like, who are you, and, and why are people saying these things about you? And the Bible says this in verse 19. Let's read it together. It says, Thus, just then, as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat questioning Jesus, his wife sends him this message. Leave this innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. You know, 
ultimately, Pilate made the decision that, you know, he said, I'm going to wash my hands of this. But ultimately, he made the decision to release a man that was a known prisoner and to hand Jesus over to the people to be crucified. Now, I can't, I don't know about you, but I can't imagine how different the story of Pilate's life might have been had he trusted in his wife's intuition. So number one, trust your wife's intuition. Secondly, the second thing that you can do to honor your wife is to be a man of God. Be a man of God. Yeah, you can clap for that. Now, guys, what if I could really simplify this for you? Like, you don't have to memorize 14 verses. What if there was one verse that I could give you that if you would memorize this verse, it would help you to become a better man of God? Does that sound like a good deal? You guys in on that? Yeah, yeah, I like it. All right, 1 so Timothy 2 and 8 says this, Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. So there's three things that we see there. Number one, if you're going to be a man of God, you need to be a praying man. If you were here last week, Pastor Melissa and Pastor Kevin both referenced what an honor it is to, to do life and ministry with Bishop. Pastor Kevin talked about just the peace he felt in his home because he would come home and his dad would be in the living room praying. And even as a young boy, he just knew life was going to be okay because his dad was a praying man. And maybe you say, I don't know how to pray. Guys, there's really no excuses anymore. There are literally apps out there where all you have to do is read the words on the screen and it'll walk you through how to pray. There, there's books where you literally can just open it up and it has a prayer for every day of the month or every day of the year. Start with that. And as you begin to, to, to get into that and get into that routine and that rhythm, it's going to flow out of you naturally to where eventually you're not going to need those tools anymore. You'll just be able to talk to God. The second thing is, it tells us, is to lift up holy hands, and that's our worship. That's our worship. Guys, when, when we're here and we're in this place of worship and our incredible band is playing and they did an amazing job today, guys, we're to be the ones leading in that. We're, the one, we're, we're to be the ones setting the example. And I don't know, if you've been around long enough, you've seen Pastor Kevin, he does that ugly little dance that he does on all the time. And it's like the goofiest thing but it's, it's worship. It's the way that he honors God. And he even says, like, I know this isn't pretty. I know I don't have any rhythm, but God, I want to honor you and I want to worship you. And then finally, it tells us to do this without anger or dispute. And if you're going to be a godly man, you need to be a man that's a peacemaking man. You need to be a man that knows how to communicate and knows how to just be gentle in your speech and humble enough to say, hey, I'm sorry, I was wrong about that. Or, or if someone's angry with you, sit down with them, figure out their perspective, figure out what you can do to make the situation better, amen? The third thing that a man can do to honor his wife is to encourage her in her gifts, encourage her in her gifts. We find a verse in Romans 12 that says this, each of us have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. And if it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. And if it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. I heard a story recently of a young pastor. He talks about his wife. And when his wife was eight years old, she had cancer in one of her eyes and she had to have her eye removed. And so for the rest of her life, she's had a prosthetic. And she talks about how as a young age, children were very cruel to her. They would make fun of her. They would make her cry several times during the week. She would run home from school crying in tears, just very, very upset. And so later in life, this caused a lot of fear for her. She had a lot of fear of rejection. She didn't like to approach people. She certainly didn't get, like to get in front of people. And in fact, when she was in high school, they only had two required classes to graduate. The first one was speech, and the second one was typing. And she actually went to her counselor and said, hey, look, because of my disability, I don't want to be a part of these. I, you know, kids make fun of me. I don't want to be in front of them. I, there's no way these should be a requirement for me. And he said, you know what? You're right. You're right. We're not going to make those a requirement for you. So fast forward years later, she marries this pastor, and 
he begins to rise in his ministry. And next thing you know, he's being asked to speak at these large conferences and he's traveling the world. But he always felt his wife was the one that was giving her, him the best nuggets. She was always reading the word and half the time he was preaching her sermons. I actually feel that way quite a bit. The best stuff that I have today is gonna come from Bobby so y'all can clap for her. But so one day he's at a conference and it's a Friday night and the conference ends on Saturday and he just gets up and he says, you know what guys, I'm not gonna preach tomorrow. My wife's gonna preach. And he made an announcement in front of thousands of people and so he goes to his hotel that night, and she is so mad at him, and she's yelling at him. And she said, what'd you preach tonight anyway? And he tells her, and she goes, you preached my only message. I gave you all that material. And he goes, well, you know what? It's about 3 o'clock in the morning. You're preaching in six hours. I think you ought to get some sleep, don't you? And so anyway, she preaches the next day, totally knocks it out of the park, knocks it out of the park. In fact, today she speaks. Uh, she's got her own channel on TBN. She speaks to thousands of women a year. Well, then a couple years later, he started writing books, and she was actually the one that was constantly editing his books and helping him to make it better. And so one day, his editor showed up to the house and was like, hey, I don't want you. I want to actually speak to your wife. You know, we're very interested in hearing her story. We'd like to have her write a book. Well, that lady's name is Lisa Bevere, and today she's a New York Times bestselling author. She has written over 16 books. And she speaks to thousands and thousands, if not millions, through the TV program every year, all because a husband decided to encourage the gifts that his wife had. Guys, encourage your wife. What an impact can your wife make? Because only you know the gifts that are inside of her behind closed doors. And if you'll encourage that, even if it's uncomfortable for her at times, look at the impact that it can make. The fourth thing that we can do is to respect our wife's opinion. Respect our wife's opinion. Recently, I heard a story of a young man. He said, you know, I, I wake up every morning and I pray for two hours a day. And it seems like my wife, the only time she really prays is like 10 minutes in the shower. But he said, every time we have to make a big life decision early on in our marriage, I would be like, she would come to me and she would give me her opinion. And he'd be like, no, no. You know, we're going to do it this way. So after several years, he realized there was this pattern, and he admits that about 90% of the time, she was right. And so he got annoyed with God, like straight up annoyed, like mad at God. He's like, God, I'm spending an hour to two hours a day praying. It seems like she's only praying 10 minutes in the shower. What is going on? Why is this happening? And so God spoke to him one day, and he said this. He said, I want you to draw a circle. So he drew a circle. He said, now, I want you to put little X's all over the circle. So he put an X, put an X, put an X. And finally he said, I want you to draw a line right down the middle of the circle. He said, that circle represents you and your wife. Y'all are one flesh. He said, however, the two sides represent you individually. The X's represent my wisdom and understanding. And you'll notice that half of the information is on her side. So guys, what he's saying is, when you don't listen to your wife's opinion, you're trying to make big decisions with only half of the information. He said, what you've gotta do is you've gotta learn to draw from your wife as the leader of your home so that you as the leader can make a decision with all of the information that I'm trying to give you. Now in our house, my little piece looks like about like this little slice of pizza right here, and the rest is Bobby, but you still get the picture and the idea, right? So guys, next time she speaks up, you may not always do what she says, but it's important that you honor and respect her opinion. Amen. The fifth thing that we can do if we're gonna honor our wives is to ask this question often, how's your heart? Or in other words, how are you really doing? You know, this is something that I practice often. Um, Bobby and I, with it being her birthday, you know, we just sat down at dinner the other night and I just said, hey, how are you doing? You know, I know life's crazy and it's hectic. How are you really doing? There was a man who, he was at a, a, a family conference and he ran into Dr. James Dobson. And he said, Dr. Dobson, I'm concerned about our families in America 
I'm concerned about, you know, the divorce rate. What is it that you think is causing these marriages to be under attack so much? And Dr. Dobson simply said, you know what? He said, I could talk about alcoholism and drug abuse. I could spend time talking about infidelity. But he said, the number one thing that I believe is attacking our marriages is that families are just, couples are just too busy these days. He said, they don't take time anymore to just go on a walk and just say, hey, how was your day? How are you doing? They don't, they don't even have time for a meaningful relationship with one another to discover and to address what each other's needs are. He said it was the busyness of life that was his biggest concern. The other part of that, guys, is I would encourage you to ask, how am I doing? You know, in other words, what can I be doing better as your husband? What can I be doing better as the leader of our home? Is there ways that I can improve that would make life easier on you? Amen? All right, number six, and we are rolling. Find her love language. Guys, if, if, if you don't hear anything else I say today, jot this one down. Find her love language. How many of you have ever heard of the five love languages? Okay, so a little, about half maybe or so. Here's the five. I'm going to give them to you so that you don't have to go home and Google it, but you still should. So the five love languages are this. Words of affirmation, which is compliments. Quality time, that's spending good time with each other. Gifts. You know, everybody, your wife, she loves flowers, she loves chocolates, whatever the thing is that you know that she loves. Acts of service and physical touch. So guys, if she's not responding to the kind of love language that you're displaying. So when Bobby and I first got married, I can remember um, I was big on acts of service because that's what I grew up around. My mom, I was raised by a single mom, and she was just always, you know, taking care of things around the house and cooking and cleaning and those things. And so when Bobby would come home, I'd, you know, I'd straighten up the house and I'd, you know, try to help out with laundry and take care of the yard. And I'd be like, oh, man, you know, she's going to come home. She's going to feel so romantic and she's going to just be into me today. And she would come home and she'd be like, thank you, babe. You know, the house looks good. And my little balloon would just kind of pop. And I'd be like, oh, man, you know, this, this isn't really what I was expecting, you know. But what I realized later on is that that was not her love language. Her love language was different. She loves whenever we spend just uninterrupted time together. That's, that's her biggest thing. And then secondly, she loves to receive gifts. And so if you're frustrated in this area and you don't know why she's not responding to the things that you're doing, it is so critically important that you figure out what that love language is. And so she told me one day, you know, I, back when we got married, I was in a lot better shape and I spent a lot of time in the gym. And I was like, man, you know, if I go to the gym and, you know, I'm looking good, like, that's, that's going to make her feel romantic. And uh, one day she told me, she said, you know, the most attractive thing that you can do? And I said, what? She said, read your Bible. And so we got about 13 Bibles at our house. <laughs> and uh, if you come to our house, there's one in every room, and you just mind your own business. Okay? <laughs> the seventh thing that we can do is to be her guardian. Be her guardian. You know, a woman, a lot of times they say that their greatest needs is security. They want to know that the house is going to be okay. We're not going to lose our house. They want to know that, you know, bills are going to be paid. They want to know that if, if something happened, you're going to stand up for them and at least speak up. And so I read this story in Nehemiah that, that really, really kind of almost brought me to tears when I read it. I thought it was very interesting and if you're not familiar with this story, God's people, the Jewish people, they had been taken into captivity because they weren't doing what God had asked them to do. They weren't honoring God. They were worshiping other gods. They were doing all these things that God told them not to do. And a lot of times when that happens, God, whenever we're not listening to him, he has to kind of remove that protection that's in place because we're not honoring him. We're not walking in his word. And so what happened is these people were taken into captivity well, it says that years later, a small remnant of them had gotten away and went back to their home city in Jerusalem. And what they realized is that the walls were completely broken down. The, the place was just destroyed. And what those walls represent is, number one, it's security. You, you can't just, you're so vulnerable to attack. You're vulnerable to the enemy just coming in on you without those walls. And then secondly, it just represented a defeated people. So they were very humiliated. And God commissioned Nehemiah to help rebuild these walls. 
And this is where we pick up in Scripture. It says this in Nehemiah 4, 13 and 14. It says, So I stationed armed men behind the wall in the lowest places, at the open positions where it was least protected. And I stationed the people in families, pay attention to that, with their swords, spears, and bows. And when I saw their fear, I stood and said to the nobles and all the officials and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and with courage from him, fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and for your homes. And what stood out to me there was that he said he put them there with their families. Guys, what that's saying to us is that he knew if I just send this man out there by himself, he may not fight with everything he's got. But if I send him to that wall and the enemy attacks and he's there with his family, he will do everything he can possibly do to protect and guard his family. <laughs> Amen? And that's how we ought to be as the men of our home. It's our job. Like it or not, guys, it's a big responsibility, but we are the spiritual leaders of our home. It's up to us to be that guardian for our wives. And sometimes it's fighting for her, and then other times it's just being that safe place where she can come and fall apart. You know, the world's crazy out there. There's a lot of things going on, and if, you're, if your wife or your fiance or girlfriend just needs a safe place to just come and fall apart, she doesn't always need you to fix the problem. She doesn't always need you to, t to tell her, hey, if you'd have read this scripture, you wouldn't be battling that. Or, hey, you ought to do this. She just needs you to listen and to just be that shoulder there for her to cry on. Cry on. Amen? All right, and number eight, the last one for how we can honor our wives is to use words wisely. Use words wisely. Proverbs 8.21 tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue. I was wondering, I was like, that must have been written to husbands, right? Like, he was trying to warn us, like, guys, if you value your life, you'll watch what you say. Years ago, there was a TV show called Kids Say the Darndest Things. Anybody ever seen that one? And they asked this little boy about marriage and relationships, and he came up with this thing. He said, you know, if I was trying to have a good marriage, what I would do is if my wife looked like a dump truck, I would still tell her that she's pretty. So even a young kid understands the principle of using our words wisely. But in seriousness, guys, if it's just an, hey, I'm sorry. I know I, I know I blew that. I know I should have done that differently. I'm sorry that I lost my temper. Hey, I love you. Hey, I just want you to know I'm not going anywhere. I know things are tough right now, but you don't, you don't have to worry. Let's use our words wisely, guys. You know, another way that you can do this is how do you talk about her when she's not around? In other words, if you worked with someone for 20 years and they never got to meet your wife, what would their perspective be of her based on your words? Are you talking down about her? Are you cutting down? Are you just airing out all the dirty laundry of frustration and anger? Or are you building her up and you're telling how wonderful she is and how beautiful she is and how funny she is and how she gave you this little piece of wisdom that changed something in your life? We need to be wise with our words. So the eight principles that I just shared with you, uh, most of them, I, some of them I changed and, and used my own, but for the most part, they're based on a book by a man named David Chadwick. David is six foot seven and he played basketball for Dean Smith at the University of uh, North Carolina. So he's what some of us would probably consider like a man's man. But what I think is even cooler is that he must be doing a good job of honoring his wife because in response to his book, his wife Marilyn wrote a book about how wives are to honor their husbands. So for the next few minutes, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I just wanna hit three ways that wives can honor your husbands. The first one is this. It's to be strong. Be strong for your husband. The Bible tells us, many of us are familiar with this verse in Genesis 2.18. It says, Then the Lord God said, It's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. As I was studying this, I realized that the word helper there is not like some of us may think where men like, Oh, I'm going to go do this, and my wife, she's going to be right there beside me, and she's going to help me. No, it actually means to save 
or to rescue. That word helper is actually the Hebrew word ezer, and ezer is related to the word rock. So women, you're to be the rock because sometimes, yes, physically we're stronger, but mentally we just don't have the capabilities that you have. Emotionally, we just, we don't have the capabilities that you have sometimes, and sometimes we just need a safe place to lean on, and we need you to be able to tell us, hey, God's got you. He's done it for you before. He'll do it for you again. We need you to be strong if you're going to honor your husband. The next thing that a woman can do to honor her husband is to build him up. Build him up. There's a couple ways that we do this. The first thing is to let him lead. Let him lead. They asked a second grader, hey, who's the boss at your house? And he said, mommy is. She doesn't want to be, but dad is just such a goofball that she has to. Sound about right? Anybody in your house? Mommy's the boss. She doesn't want to be, but she's got to. But seriously, ladies, you may know the word better than your husband, and you may know about prayer, and you may know all these deep spiritual things, but invite him to pray sometimes. Say, hey, our kids aren't feeling well. Would you come over here and lay hands and pray on them? Hey, babe, what, what scriptures are encouraging you lately? You know, I'm feeling down. You don't have to show your cards off to him and make him feel inferior. Let him take the lead sometimes. My wife, I'm convinced she could run a Fortune 500 company. She's got so many gifts in her, but she still lets me lead. And I'm so thankful for that. I'm so honored by that. The next thing that you can do is to speak words of life. And one of the simplest, most powerful ways you can do that is just to talk well. Express gratitude for your husband in front of others. Express gratitude for your husband in front of others. Tell him how much he means to you and how appreciative you are for him and how proud you are of the job that he's, he's working so hard for you and your family. Speak words of life. The final thing that we're going to cover today for how wives can honor a husband is to guard your home. And this is kind of the things that Marilyn said. She said, one of the ways you can guard your home is to not let social media dominate your time together. Don't let social media dominate your time together. Take, take that phone and just set it aside. Turn it off. If you're at dinner, you know, turn it over, put it on vibrate. You know, maybe you're worried about the kids or something and, you know, whatever the case may be, but Try to spend, when you're there with your spouse and it's just you, try to spend as little time on that phone as you can. I mean, it's, it's easy for all of us. We all struggle in this area to just get sucked into that thing. And next thing you know, 30 minutes or an hour has gone by and you haven't even asked your wife how, or your husband how their day is. And so this, this really goes both ways. She also said that uh, another way you can guard your home is to go to bed at the same time as your husband. I'll let you dig into the scripture yourself for what that's about. But it does say that a husband and wife aren't to deprive each other of physical relations. That's, that's not me talking. That's, that's in the Bible. And then finally she said, work hard at keeping peace in your home. They did a study of American husbands, and uh, when they asked them, you know, what, what's some of the most important things to you and a wife? And the one thing that the men said was, was higher than even an amazing physical relationship with their wife. They said, above all, it was peace in the home. When I come home, I just, I want to have peace in the house. I don't want to be fighting and bickering and quarreling. I want to, I want to be greeted when I walk in the door. I want to know that everything's okay. I was at Kroger's yesterday going to get some gifts for Bobby, and I saw, I, I don't know the situation, I don't know the story, but I just saw this couple uh, the guy was walking to the car. She was already there loading up with the groceries and things. And she was just yelling at him and yelling at him. And I just, I, she was getting so loud I couldn't help but look over. And he's, he's walking and he's pushing the cart back to the cart area. And he was just shaking his head. And I was like, you know, I, I don't know the situation. Maybe he deserved it. But I know that the car ride home is not going to be very pleasant. Um, and, you know, men, we just, women, we, we want peace in the house. Amen. Can I got some guys say amen? amen? I like it. Now, maybe you're here today and you're going, you know what? My marriage is in rough shape or, you know, my, my spouse, the person that I love, I don't even know 
if they're living for the Lord or, you know, they're not here today. They don't really care to come to church. You know, what would you say then? What, what would you do in that situation? Well, you know, I'm thankful for God's word because 1 Corinthians 7 tells us that, ladies, the way that you treat your husband, the way that you live for the Lord and the way you honor him, it says this in the message translation. It says, God has called us to make the best of it, to make it as peaceful, make it peacefully as we can. And it says, you never know, wives, the way you handle this might bring your husband not only back to you, but to God. Other translations tell us that your, your husband or your wife can be saved, even if they're not living for God at all, by your conduct and the way that you honor them and the way that you love the Lord. Guys, how are we doing on time? I, my clock's not working back there. How, what time is it? We're good? Okay. So if you're feeling a little defeated today, a little beat up, and you're like, man, that's, that's a pretty big list. You know, I'm not really living up to that right now. I kind of want to end today a little bit differently. I want us to spend some time laughing together. And so I've got a little video for you guys, and then we'll close it out. So do we have that ready to go, guys? We're going to start discussing men's brains, women's brains, and how they're very different from each other. Now, I want to start with men's brains, all right? Now, men's brains are, are very unique. Men's brains are made up of little boxes, and we have a box for everything. We've got a box for the car. We've got a box for the money. We've got a box for the job. We've got a box for you. We've got a box for the kids. We've got a box for your mother somewhere in the basement. we got... <laughs> we got we, we got boxes everywhere. And, and the rule is, the boxes don't touch. <laughs> when a man discusses a particular subject, we go to that particular box, we pull that box out, we open the box, we discuss only what is in that box. All right? And, and, and then we close the box and put it away being very, very careful not to touch any other boxes. Sorry, my Catholic upbringing got in there for a minute, but I... <laughs> I I'm not a Catholic, but I went to Catholic school when I was little. I, I had a nun who taught on hell like she was born and raised there. I mean, I'll never forget it, but... Uh... <laughs> it did me good, actually. It was a good thing. Now, women's brains are very, very different from men's brains. Women's brains are made up of a big ball of wire. And everything is connected to everything. And the money's connected to the car, and the car's connected to your job, and your kids are connected to your mother, and everything's connected to everything. And it's like... It's like the internet superhighway, okay? And, and it's all driven by energy that we call emotion. It's, just, it's, it's, it's one of the reasons why women tend to remember everything. Because if you take an event and you connect it to an emotion, it burns in your memory and you can remember it forever. The same thing happens for men. It just doesn't happen very often because, quite frankly, we don't care. Uh, Women tend to care about everything. And she just loves it. <laughs> okay.
Now, men, we have a box in our brain that most women are not aware of. This particular box has nothing in it. It's true. It's true. In fact, we call it the nothing box. <laughs> and of all the boxes a man has in his brain, the nothing box is our favorite box. <laughs> if a man has a chance, he'll go to his nothing box every time. <laughs> We're going to start discussing men's brains, women's brains. Is that true or what, guys? Yeah. So I hope today, you know, if, if things are good in your marriage and, you know, things are going really well for you, then I hope I gave you a few tools to make it even better because God wants us to honor one another. He wants us to live well and peaceably together. But, you know, if you're here and you're going, you know, I, I'm nowhere close to that. Like, I've got so much to work on. I've got so much to do. Then I hope a couple things would encourage you. Number one, you now have a plan. I just laid out a scriptural based plan for you where you can go home and start to implement some of these things. But secondly, you've got to remember, God can restore anything. Our Bible tells us that he's a healer and it says that he makes all things new. So it doesn't matter where you're at today. It doesn't matter how hopeless the situation might look. God is able in a moment to turn things around for you. I wanna close with just this one more thought. They asked a leading marriage expert. They said, what does it take to make a marriage work? What is it that's the common thing with marriages when they're just going really well and they just succeed? And he said this, he said, the common denominator with a successful marriage is that when you ask each person, they would rate the other one higher than their self. And that's actually a scriptural based thing because Philippians two and three tells us, don't be selfish, don't try to impress others, but being humble, think of others better than yourself. So it's all about put that other person before you, you know? What are their needs? Am I doing a good job of meeting their needs or am I just thinking about myself? Yes, I'm tired. Yes, I'm hungry. Yes, I'm irritated and I worked long this week and things were crazy, but does my wife feel honored today? Does she feel loved? Does, does my husband know how much I appreciate him? Would you stand with me all over the house? You know, all these are good principles, but without God in the mix, it really won't do a whole lot. Um, the Bible tells us, you know, seek first the kingdom of God and then everything else in life will be added. And so if you want a good relationship, whether it's someday or whether it's right now, or you're looking forward to that husband or that wife someday, or you're in the midst of marriage right now and things are difficult, I just invite you to turn it over to the Lord. And if, if you're here today and you don't even know God yet, or, you know, you feel far from him, then the first thing I want to invite us to do is as a group, I just want us to pray. And if you're here this morning and you've never given your life to the Lord, you haven't surrendered to him, or maybe you did years and years ago when you were young, but you'd like to do that again. We're going to just say this prayer together. And I just invite you in that moment to just pray along with us and ask the Lord to, to come over and take charge in your life. Let's just pray church. Lord Jesus, Thank you so much for your love for me. I thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for my sin. He was buried and he rose again three days later. Today I ask you Jesus to be the Lord and savior of my life. I give control over to you and I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you give a hand clap of praise for everybody who prayed? At this time, I'm just going to ask our prayer partners to come forward. And if you need prayer for anything marriage related or not, if you're sick in your body, if you're needing some financial breakthrough, if you're dealing with fear and anxiety, whatever it is that you're battling today, 
we want to go into the battle with you. You've got a church family that loves you, that's praying for you, and you're not in this thing alone. So I invite you as we continue to worship to come forward for, for prayer. And uh, if you've got everything you need from the Lord, you can be dismissed. But I just ask you to just kind of linger in this moment and just kind of receive from the Lord. Amen.